Hi again from sunny California. I'm Trish Gray. I'm the Senior Development Manager from the O'Reilly School of Technology. And you may have been here earlier this morning when I talked to Pearl expert Peter Scott. And now I'm really excited to chat with Python expert Steve Holden. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Hi, Steve. How are Hi. you doing? I'm very well, thanks. And you? Good. Good. Steve is the author of our Python programming certificate series, which has been wildly popular. And he is also the uh, author of Python Web Programming. He is the chairman of the Python Software Foundation. So if you've been to PyCons, you will see him there. Um, he has used Python a long, long time. He has a company called Holden Web LLC, which offers system design and implementation consultancy and training and in information technologies to a worldwide audience. Um, he lives in Portland, and today he's going to talk about Python Release 2 versus Release 3. Now, our courses teach Python Release 3, but there may be times when you need Python 2. So without further ado, I give you Steve Holden. Thanks very much. Yes, today really, um, I want primarily to be, to be answering people's questions. So if, if you can keep an eye on the questions that come through in the, uh, the feed uh, and keep us, keep us supplied with them, that yes. would be great. But really, I, I would like to address two sets of needs. There are Python 2 users uh, already existing who will be thinking about moving to Python 3, and people never seem to get tired of, of talking about that. So we can talk about migration strategies, differences between the languages and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also, of course, the O'Reilly students who are taking Python 3 because we decided that that would be the optimum uh, language for them to learn in terms of long-term value for money. And they're probably going to be wondering, well, how do I, how do I adapt my Python 3 knowledge to Python 2 mm -hmm. without, uh, you know, without compromise or you know, is, is it going to be difficult? Uh, and the good news is that actually it, it shouldn't be at all difficult. So really, as far as the Python Software Foundation is concerned, mm -hmm. Python 2.7 uh, is the status quo. That's, that's the language which we feature primarily on the website, the one which we suggest that uh, if people are going to be using Python, then that would be uh, the natural one to go for. Okay. Now, some time ago, Guido van Rossum, the inventor of Python, decided that we needed to make a, a break from the previous language and we needed the freedom uh, to actually uh, break backward compatibility, which in in the past has always been very important to the uh, to the language co community, mm -hmm. so 3.0 did actually uh, allow Guido to regularize several aspects of the language. So 3.x, in fact, we're currently at 3.2. Oh, 3.2. Yep, 3.2 was released a couple of a couple of days ago. So okay. thanks to the developers for for that good job. But I think it's fair to say that, that there are some things um, that might make 3.2 unsuitable. So the first question people have is which, which version should I be using? And at the moment, the most likely reason for not using Python 3 mm -hmm. uh, would be the somewhat limited library support that's there. Now, that's, that's not a surprise. I mean, when we started the development of Python 3, uh, Guido, I think, said that Python 3 wouldn't really be ready for, for about five years after right. it's been released. Right. So there are some, I mean, there's a lot of work going on to port libraries, and there is, uh, I think there's a site called getpython3.net, uh, which is trying to keep track of which libraries have been ported to, to version 3 uh, and which ones haven't. But there are, another reason why you might have to consider using version 2, of course, is you may not have any control over the version of Python that you get to use. So if you're building web systems and your hosting company right. only offers Python 2.6, well, sure. then you only can use Python 2.6. I mean, if you're at a company, then there's, there's usually a lot of fear about being a first adopter of a new version because of possible bugs that might come about and, and just the, the lack of stability necessarily. That's true, yeah. yes. Um, although, of course, nobody's going to be using anything point zero now because Python 3 has gone through, we've, we started with 3.1 right. and 3.0, yeah, 3 and now we've had 3.1 and 3.2. Mm -hmm. So the distribution is maturing, and there's not really any question about the, the quality of the code in Python 3. Sure. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that at the moment, uh, in some of the libraries, there's a, there are still issues that we're dealing with. Uh, involving the change from uh, regular ASCII strings to Unicode strings. Ah. And there are particular areas, for example, in email, mm -hmm. you have to sometimes be able to handle content with multiple Unicode encodings 
inside the same piece of text. Okay. Uh, and so there are some really nasty little wrinkles that people like David Murray have been working on. And um, I'm not sure how far they've got with the, with the 3.2 release, but I do know a huge amount of work has been done in that area and it's going to continue. So 3.3, I'm hoping, we'll see uh, most of those out of the way. Am I jumping the gun by asking how backwards compatible it is? Uh, not at all, no. Um, in fact, there, there is a good deal of, of backward compatibility. Uh, the syntax changed somewhat, but quite a few Python 2 programs can actually just move straight forward and run on Python oh, 3. fantastic. Um, the main changes that have taken place in the language uh, are that print is no longer a statement, it's a function which gives people much more flexibility to organize their own printing if they want to. You can um, override. You can yeah, override you, can over, you can override the, print func the, the built-in mm -hmm. print function with your own, uh, your own versions if you want, and, sure. and those can be used by other people as well. Okay. So you can effectively change the way the printing subsystem works, which you couldn't really in, in Python right. 3, very, in Python right. 2 right. Uh, very easily. So apart from that, in Python 2, a lot of uh, object functions and methods which tend to return lists, mm -hmm. in Python 3, will either return uh, an iterator, that's something that produces values one at a time on demand, mm -hmm. or what's called a view, which is basically just uh, effectively a method for accessing certain types of data in an object that, that don't require us to create a whole list. And the, the intention behind that uh, is to conserve memory, primarily, I think, and, and to make programs more efficient. Um, apart from that, well, there were a few other wrinkles. Integers became effectively unbounded, so now you can you can have integers as large as you like in Python. Uh, division. That wasn't the case before. Uh, well, before we had integer type, we had an integer type, and we had a long type, uh -huh. and they weren't really unified. Whereas now, if you create an integer, you can just okay. you can create an integer of any sort and of any any value, and they'll all be the same type. Okay, and I'm so assuming. Yep. I, sorry, I, I, no, I'm not ahead. super familiar with Python. So Python is a strongly typed language. Uh, Python is a strongly typed language, although okay. there are no declarations in there okay. and there's no need to associate data of a particular type with a particular variable name as there is in, in static so languages. So there's automatic type conversion? Uh, no, not, auto or not automatic type conversion, but the type, is, okay. is the type goes with the data, not with the variables. Yeah. Okay, yeah? understood. Good. So yes, there have been, um, there's the change from in strings, of course. Uh, from ASCII strings to Unicode. And uh, so that's caused a, a new byte. I think we've got byte strings and byte arrays in the language now for people to be able to handle 8-bit bytes uh, more effectively when you're handling byte streams rather than uh, textual information. And then there are some syntax changes to do things like introduce uh, function annotations so that you can add information about the, uh, potentially about the types of arguments to a function and the type of value it returns. Uh, you can now have uh, dict and set object comprehensions, so you can uh, create dicts and sets algorithmically in the same way that you, you always have been able to in Python 2 with lists. Okay. So how are we doing on the question side? I mean, this is basically what, what I'd like to talk about, so if people have got questions. Uh, someone says, uh, Adam Pat, uh, gives us a question. Can you mm -hmm. please talk about how string handling is going to change for someone used to Python 2? Well, that depends on what types of strings you're handling, basically. Um, but I would say if you're handling ASCII, uh, shouldn't expect any problems at all. Mm -hmm. If you're handling Unicode, it should really become easier because basically now uh, you shouldn't get any of the, the problems that we used to get, for example, trying to print out Unicode strings to a non-Unicode terminal when you'd start to see errors because it would complain that uh, non-ASCII values were, were present in the string, that kind of thing. So string handling's effectively going to remain exactly the same, except that now strings allow you to use the full Unicode set instead of just the ASCII character set. Um, can you, can you uh, speak a little bit to Unicode versus non-Unicode? What, what are the advantages of using Unicode? Well, the principal advantage is that you can write programs which will deal with native character sets for users throughout the world. Okay. Um, I think in, in terms of historical inevitability, we're, we're all going to have to switch to Unicode sooner or later. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people in the information technology industry, I think, have been deferring 
coping with that pain. Procrastination. Procrastination, exactly, yes. Programmers are so good at that. Well, they are, aren't they? But, um, for example, Java got it right in, in their design. You know, Java was a, a language that used Unicode right from the get-go. Sure. And so they've been struggling with the, uh, the issue, you know, Java programs have been struggling with the issues of Unicode for a, a good long time. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Python, I mean, there was a, a, a major uh, push forward at, I think it was at the 2.2 release, or maybe 2.0, but anyway, I remember that Mark andre Lemberg uh, spent a long time integrating Unicode in as a separate data type in Python 2. Okay. But now, of course, it's everything's unified, and if, if it's textual, it's in Unicode, and you can use pretty much whatever characters you want. Okay, excellent, excellent. Good. Um, so, you know, can you, can you speak a little bit to the things that are taught in Python 3 in the courses that, that might become an issue if someone is using Python 2? Well, the primary one is the print statement, I suppose, um, uh -huh. because you, you can't use a function yeah. uh, in the same way as you can in Python 2. Although, in fact, in Python 2.7, and possibly 2.6 as well, I don't remember, uh, you can import the print, state, the print function from the future. Uh -huh. um, for non-Python programmers, we have this, this notional module called underscore underscore future underscore underscore. And if you can import things from that, and they actually change the way the compiler, the interpreter works. Okay. So, for example, we used to be able to say uh, from future import division, uh, mm -hmm. and then we had the uh, future implementation of, of division present in the language. Okay. So, um, yeah, we can, what was the question again? <laughs> I was saying, you know, you were saying that we teach Python version 3 yep. in the courses oh, right. themselves, yep. and, and uh, will, will any students that learn that run into any troubles with certain things? I would say any... If they any, go to a job that uses Python 2. No, any competent programmer is going to be able to convert in less than a day, I would really? have thought. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not that different a language. There are some wrinkles, but it's, it's fundamentally, it's still Python. Okay. It's not that different. Um, and of course, there's there's a two to three converter which will allow you to take your there's existing Python two code uh, and move it forward. It is not guaranteed to be a hundred percent effective, okay. but it will do the heavy lifting for for a conversion. And nowadays, there's there's even a three to two converter which will allow you to take your Python three programs. And the people who are working on that are targeting being able to go back to different Python two versions. Sure. from your, your Python 3 code. And so that just goes to show you how wonderful the Python community is, that they just immediately hop on that. Well, I mean, the <laughs> Python the Python community, I have to say, I, I do think is wonderful. But the, the problem with saying it, of course, is that some people think it's not. And so when we say the Python community is wonderful, we just sound uh, arrogant and, and self self-aggrandizing, so I, I try not to say too much uh, along those lines okay, we already have in a public. We have a question here from yep. Doug Hellman. How reliable is oh, hi, 2 Doug. to 3 for converting older code? How reliable is 2 to 3 for converting older code? It's pretty good. I think you can assume from a, at, at a first approximation, I would say that 2 to 3 is going to do between 95 and 99 percent of the, the job of converting your program to Python 3. So okay. I think it, it does well. Uh, the migration strategy that's recommended mm -hmm. is to start your code in Python 2.6 or 2.7, mm -hmm. the, the most current version of, of Python 2, and then to run it through the 2 to 3 converter. If you get any errors that mean that you get a, an unsatisfactory Python 3 program, mm -hmm. then you could the, the recommendation is that you modify your Python 2 in such a way that not only does it remain valid Python 2, but also the 2 to 3 converter can, can uh, produce valid Python 3. Okay. And the intention behind that is that you should be able to run Python 2 and Python 3 implementations of your program from a single source tree. Interesting. Because uh, the Python world uh, has a lot of recent experience with coping with multiple source trees. Okay. Uh, because the development of Python 3 meant that, that the, the developers had to maintain Python 2 and Python 3 in parallel. Okay. So whenever you're developing a version of a, of a piece of software like Python, you have your, your trunk version, which is where development is currently going. Uh -huh. You have your, your latest tagged release, and you may need to branch right. off that to produce um, maintenance releases. Right. So that means that effectively anyone who's been contributing actively to the Python code base for the past four or five years has had to be managing four separate 
uh, chunks of sauce right. in order to be able to integrate changes everywhere they needed to go. Oh my gosh. So, so, it so this way they don't hard. have to do that because they'll have one base code base well, for both for both versions. That's right. Yeah. I mean okay. the, the developers who develop Python of course they're actually writing right. in C. So okay. they they had to maintain those four trees but Interesting. the idea behind the 2 to 3 converter is that there's regular Python users who are programming applications in mm -hmm. Python mm -hmm. uh, should be able to get a lot of good help modifying their code to Python 3 and and should be able to maintain Great. a uniform source code tree for both versions of the Oh that's the program. wonderful. So if you have say a, a beta version which which uses Python 3, a beta version of your application, yep. and then you've got a live version that you have to keep maintaining. You can do that without having to reinvent the wheel backwards and forwards all the time. Well, yeah, I mean, if you've got a if you've got a live version and a and a test version, you're probably still maintaining those. You're probably still maintaining code in both both branches. Okay. Uh, but the ability to have uh, a product which can run on Python 2 or on Python 3 is ultimately, I think, what's going to move the language forward. Okay, I, I have some more questions here. Good. I have to scroll back up. I've got so many. Uh, Paul Berry, who, hi Paul. He's the uh, author of our uh, Head First Python book. He yep. says, uh, don't forget a uh, big issue with how DIV works can lead to hard to find bugs. How but which works? Sorry, DID? How DIV. DIV works. What are we talking about there? I'm are not sure I have dips? the right are we context. Talking dips, Is this Paul? a web question? Yeah, is that is that what we're talking about? That we we have a question from uh, from Farrell Kramer. I'm learning Python yep. three in your courses. Oh, hey, good! Congratulations! Thanks a lot. Farrell. Yeah. Yay. Um, and whoops. But want to eventually use Django for projects, which is only Python two. Any advice? Uh, well, of course, Django and Python three are are moving closer together. So it, I think in you know in the next couple of releases, I'm assuming. I don't have any insi inside information, but I'm assuming that Django will be uh, migrating to Python 3 at some stage. Uh, but again, uh, the advice is simply don't worry about it. Your Python 3 studies will tell you quite enough about Python that Python 2 is not going to seem like a foreign country. It's just going to seem like a slightly different language. And so um, while you know, we, may, we may start to feel perhaps a bit schizophrenic writing some days in Python 3 and, and some days in Python 2, in actual fact, it's, it's yeah. relatively easy to transfer the, the Python 3 skills to Python 2. So sure. you've got no need to worry about that. Yeah, I mean, Python is still Python. The syntax is, is generally going right. to be the same. That's right. It's yes, effectively. Quirks here or there. I mean, the way Guido talked about it was, was about removing warts from the language, as he called it, rather than. So it's not a radical revision of the language. It's simply uh, an attempt to make the, to apply the, the design principles behind Python mm -hmm. more uniformly and more consistently. Excellent. Brian Jones asks. Oh, so hi, Brian. Oh, you know Brian? Too. I you know, know Brian, everyone yeah. here. Oh, great. I know quite a it's few a people yeah, in the Python world. Okay, he says, uh, some methods in certain modules return bytes in 3.x where they return strings in 2.x. The yep. base64 module comes to mind, but I wonder how widespread that is. Other modules? Well, um, I'm not sure about other modules, but just addressing the, the question, the specific question that was asked there about uh, base64. For every module in Python 2 that produced a string output, mm -hmm. the developers had to effectively ask themselves, well, is that string that they're producing, is that going to be used as text, or, or does it really, is it really just a byte stream that has to be communicated in its exact binary form? Mm -hmm. Uh, to some recipient. Now, mostly it's obvious, but for questions like you know, base64 encoding, where what you're actually doing is encoding uh, a, particular uh, a particular set of characters into a, another code, which uses um, six bits to represent each, each character, and then uses printable characters for them. Mm -hmm. The problem there is that although alphabetic characters are used inside the encoding, uh, the encoding of a base64 object it isn't really a textual thing at all. Uh, the character set's very limited and there's no need to use Unicode characters since you only have 64 different characters in the, uh -huh. in the encoding. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, there are a few places like that where you, you might expect a string and what you actually get back is, is a byte string. 
Uh, but overall, the reasons for the differences have, have been uh, close consideration of what the most appropriate type is. Now, obviously, if you're used to working totally in ASCII, mm -hmm. then this is going to cause a little bit of pain, and you're going to have to modify perhaps your code, some techniques that you use. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's the best way. It's the best way. And I think that the, the reason they chose a byte representation for base64 was because the base64 encoding isn't really a textual representation of anything at all. It's not intended to be human readable text. It's simply a way to get information across a network stream. Uh, from and so that's why, yeah, so that's why they, they wouldn't use Unicode, okay. I would imagine. Uh, Sean Milochik, I hope I said that right. Oh yeah, the Sean Milochik. Okay, you know. Hi Sean. <laughs> yeah, I know Sean. Uh, what are some other good uses for the with statement besides file handles in the core language, or is it mainly for third-party libraries to support? Yeah, okay. Well, for those of you who've not used the with statement, the with, uh, this is not just a Python 3 feature, by the way. I think it came in in Python 2.5. But the with statement allows you to declare what are called context managers, which mean that the, the with statement, like the do and the for, takes an indented suite uh, that it controls. So when you say with some expression as variable name, okay. it takes the expression, and the expression actually has to have two methods. Um, and I think they're called dunder enter and dunder exit. I can't actually remember the names of okay. the methods. But uh, the first method is called uh, to create an object, which is then assigned to the variable. And then uh, after the indented suite has mm -hmm. been executed, mm -hmm. the dunder exit method is called either to handle an exception that might have been raised or to make sure that any necessary cleanup is done. Okay. So basically, the with statement is a nice way uh, of wrapping up a block of code in such a way that you can guarantee that finalization is going to take place. About the most interesting application I've seen of the with statement in the past uh, year was something that Raymond Hettinger showed at EuroPython last year when he was actually demonstrating uh, new different ways to, to write asynchronous code in Python. And he actually uh, used the context handler to establish the code, which, which was the asynchronous task. So that's, that's probably the most interesting thing I can remember the, the with statement being used for. But it's still a fairly new feature. And I think people are still getting used to the idea that, uh, that the with statement can save them pain. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Brian Jones. Thanks for all the questions, guys. This is great. Most rumblings I hear from the community about porting don't line up with my experience. One complaint I can't confirm or deny is about brokenness in the email module. Do you know of any specific issues with that module? Okay, well, first of all, for, for readers who don't know uh, or listeners who don't know Brian Jones, oh, I suppose the viewers, aren't they? This is a webcast. Hello there. Uh, <laughs> for anyway, for any of you who... Viewers and participants. <laughs> yeah, okay. For any of you who don't know, Brian Jones is actually uh, in collaboration with... Oh dear, somebody whose name I've forgotten, but Brian will doubtless remind us. But anyway, Brian is one of two co-authors who are working on a Python 3 version mm -hmm. of uh, O'Reilly's Python cookbook. Okay, great. So he's actually a, an O'Reilly author as well. Oh, that's right, it's David Beasley, Brian tells us now. Sorry about that, David. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Brian's um, working on that. And so anybody who ever had a recipe in the, the Python cookbook should definitely uh, go and update it and make sure that it's ported to Python 3, <laughs> yes. because I don't think that, that David and Brian are planning to put any Python 2 recipes in the, the next version of the cookbook. Okay. So that'll be encouraging to people. But yeah, he was asking about the email module. The email module is the module where the Unicode issue has raised its head most seriously. And um, I do know that there's some serious work being done by David Murray on underpinning that. Mm -hmm. And um, the Python Software Foundation has, has even funded David's efforts partially. Uh, and I think if, if anybody knows uh, how we could get funding to, to get David to finish the job, I would be very interested to hear about it because the email module does still need some work. And okay. you have to remember the email module 
uh, is what the mailman utility runs on, and the mailman utility must be handling millions of, of uh, mailing lists throughout the world. So we definitely want to get things so that mailman can run on, on Python 3 as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah the, mail, the, mail, the email module is one of the places where we're feeling most stress, uh, but it is, it is achieving attention. It is receiving attention, yes. just it's not as quickly. On. Yeah, just not as quickly as I'd like. Yeah, so stay tuned on that. I guess is the, is the point. Uh, we have a question. Is the Python Software Foundation sponsoring any sprints or porting efforts for libraries that are not yet supporting Python 3.x? Um, yes, we are, in fact. Um, the Python Software Foundation recently, or fairly recently, undertook an initiative uh, at the behest of Jesse Nola, who joined the, the board this year, to, to start to fund sprints. So uh, any uh, group of Python programmers who want to sprint and need funding support mm -hmm. should definitely uh, contact the Python Software Foundation. Now, we're, uh, obviously there are sprints coming up uh, at PyCon, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but there are other sprints as well. Also, uh, the Google Summer of Code yes. operation last year, uh, Python Software Foundation is always a mentor for several of those um, of those projects and Ark Riley, the coordinator, mm -hmm. um, made sure that a lot of the projects were focused on migrating libraries to, to Python 3. Yeah, so great. throughout the community there is um, big support for moving to, to Python 3. Okay. And uh, thanks everyone for the great job you're all doing. Yeah, that's great. I, I wonder, I have a question of my own about okay. are there any really well-known Python 2 libraries that just will not be ported because maybe it's defunct or doesn't work within the paradigm of Python 3. I, I have a, a nightmare experience from mm -hmm. a long time ago in C++, this dates okay. me, I'm sorry, um, in which uh, a very well-known string library that I, I knew and loved and, and peppered throughout my code everywhere yep. that I had it yep. was just completely lost in the next version. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and it caused me so much trouble, and my poor sysadmin so much trouble because he had to actually port two different versions of C++ for a while until uh, I was able to sift through that whole thing. Great, wonderful. No, well, the answer is I'm I'm not aware of any major libraries that are that are going to be lost in the the migration <sighs> from two to three. That's a relief. <laughs> Good. Well, you, we say Python comes with batteries included. I mean, it does have a very large library that's already largely ported to Python 3, but there are a huge number of third-party uh, third libraries as well, and uh, we're definitely hoping that, that authors will migrate to 3 as quickly as they can. Great. Eric Norberg asks, can you quantify the speed differences between 2 and 3? No. Um, as far That's as I know, question. yeah, I, all, I, all I'm really saying is I've, I've not done any benchmarks. As far as I know, Python 3.0 uh, started out with a major performance uh, lag against Python 2. Mm -hmm. But the biggest problem seemed to be the uh, input-output module, which was rewritten in C for release 3.1. Oh. And I've not heard of any major differences in speed. I think that Python 3 is certainly within 15%, you know, let's say, of, of Python 2. So within a standard deviation? Within a standard deviation, sure. certainly, yes. But of course, the other thing is that um, there are also other implementations of Python now. There's, there's Iron Python from the .NET arena. Uh, there's uh, the PyPy, PYPY project, where mm -hmm. they've, they've actually used Python as a tool for developing a Python compilation system. Okay. Um, so there are a number of different implementations. So in, at the moment, um, you may feel constrained by speed, but I think it's you know the, there have been speed up efforts going on for Python three with the Unladen Swallow project, which uh, may be a little stalled at the moment. Um, certainly, the PyPy people have been producing some very, uh, very, very impressive benchmarks recently, which show that their performance is clearly going to be at least equal to the the current C Python implementation. Great. And so there's all kinds of interesting developments taking place, uh, which means that overall, I'm not really too worried about about Python execution performance. I think so it seems like people will, will adopt it pretty quickly and, and uh, port everything over pretty quickly. I'm Just certainly no hoping so. Like yes, I hope so. Uh, Martin Hines asks, can you give quality can you give quality resources on the differences from Python two to three? So are there any books that can uh, that can speak to this? 
Um, now that's interesting. I do know that Some Python three. Articles. I do know that Python three books have started to appear, mm -hmm. uh, but I have to say most of my Python three learning has been done through the community and, and with the Python documentation. One could take so the Python three courses and then take a indeed. Python two book. Yep, one could indeed. Good anyone idea. who's <laughs> taken the Py anyone who's taken the Python three courses will certainly be able to pick up a, a Python two book and learn it without any sure. any problems at all. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm not that familiar with the, the Python 3 literature, but it is now starting to, to appear. Uh, and I think the Python 3 cookbook, when it, when it comes out, is going to be uh, something that many people will go to as a, to use as a resource okay. uh, for working code. Great. Uh, Paul Berry asks another question. What's the big issue with uh, WSGI support in 3? Is it broken? WSGI support. Uh, Whiskey. The big issue. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's all I'm right. WSGI. WSGI. It, it's just a standard interface for uh, web systems. Okay. So you can. The idea is that you can use a WSGI framework sure. and then use you know, some Django modules, some Turbo Gears modules, or whatever. So it's okay. just a standard way to present um, webs. But yeah, the the WSGI, uh, specification needed some rework. Um, because again, uh, the web is another of those areas where sometimes you have to deal with byte streams where some of the information is in one encoding, some of the information is in another. Uh, and so, yeah, there were some issues with the standard, which as far as I know were resolved about three or four months ago. And uh, I haven't looked at the 3.2 WSGI module, but I'd be very surprised if, if that wasn't implementing the new standard. So I, I don't think there are any issues, but uh, I will, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, Chris Candillo, Candillo excuse me, asks, uh, will the Python Software Foundation or O'Reilly School be supporting joint slash collaborative projects among the students? Um, I, I can say that Scott uh, here at the school has been uh, working with someone at uh, the University of Toronto um, regarding eventual capstone projects which involve collaborative uh, open source uh, projects throughout the world. Um, I can't speak much to that now, but stay tuned because that's coming. And, and even if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash O'Reilly School, you can see a, an interview with the University of Toronto guy about that. I, I don't know his name. I'm sorry. So, And uh, are there anything with the Python Software Foundation? Well, the Python Software Foundation already supports Google Summer of Code, uh, which means that uh, we are trying to in involve students uh, fairly early on. Um, I don't think we've got uh, specific plans, or at least yeah, I've, I've not discussed any specific plans to collaborate with, with universities outside the, uh, and schools outside the scope of, of Google Summer of Code. But basically, I think you can take it that the, the foundation is going to be encouraging uh, whatever we can, whatever activities we can, to make sure that porting effort uh, is, is applied. So I'm certainly not averse to, to collaboration with, uh, with anyone at all. Great. And uh, I don't know if viewers know it, but the, the O'Reilly School has actually been um, discussing its future this week. And I've got nothing specific to say about that myself since I'm only a, a course author, except that I've heard about some, some potentially very exciting developments, which I think are going to, uh, to be to, to all students' benefit. Andrew Lewis from the mm -hmm. University of Toronto. So maybe we should uh, hook him up with the Python Software Foundation. <laughs> good idea. Yes. Going there. Absolutely Very good idea. right. Okay. Um, Antonio Rodriguez mm -hmm. asks, will PyPy include works with capability for seamless portability with Py uh, Python 2 slash 3? Works with capability for seamless portability with Python 2 works 3. So, ah, right. Okay. Yeah, this question, now I, I can see it on the screen. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, the PyPy is the Python package index, PYPI. Uh, or Pi P, I think we may oh, have Pi to. Pr I don't really know what the pronunciation of, I have to of learn that is. My Python well, it used to be acronyms. called the it used to be called the cheese shop. So uh, <laughs> that was even even more obscure. Although it was just a, a Monty Python, it was based on a Monty Python sketch. But okay. anyway, um, no. As far as I know, uh, I can't remember now whether Pi P is treating Python two and three as entirely separate languages. I I I believe the intention is that you should be able to download both Python 2 and Python 3 versions of the same module uh, from Pipey. Mm -hmm. But where they're up to with that effort, I don't know. If one of the, uh, one of the Python guys wants to, uh, sorry, one of the uh, Pipey guys wants to, to let me have a, 
uh, uh, drop me a line, I'll pass the information on. But I, I don't know where they're up to with that effort right now. Okay. Rhonda Heath, great to see you again, Rhonda. Uh, she asks, uh, what is the word on deprecations in version 3 versus version 2? Are there many? Uh, not that many, no. I can't actually remember exactly what's, what's been deprecated. Uh, but it's, it's nothing really that you'll miss. I think um, map is still in, reduce may have gone, I seem to remember. May, that may be the, oh, I, I, I honestly don't know. But no, not, no major deprecations. Is there a uh, place on python.org where they can check for uh, any documentation? The place to go would be the, if you just Google for uh, what's new in Python 3.0, then you'll, you'll see the, uh, the information about what's been dropped from the language. Okay. But, it was, it was relatively little. OK. Uh, I have a question from Mike Leroy. Do you know anything about WX Python going to 3? Um, not a lot, no. In fact, um, I, s I do remember seeing on the WX Python website some news which implied that Robin Dunn uh, was thinking of revamping the framework fairly radically, in which case I'd be very surprised if he wasn't going to, uh, g going to support Python 3 at the same time, but I've, I've no specific information and Robin would be the best person to ask about that okay. as he's okay. the, the maintainer of WX Python. Okay, we have a question from Dom, Tom DeLosier. Uh, the LDAP module, I think I heard, was going to need a full rewrite. How do I... How do I vote for help for how it? How do I vote for help for it? Or how do you it? get votes for help for it? That's, that's an, an interesting general question, in fact. Mm -hmm. Um, the foundation would would be happy to be able to provide developers with information about you know where it was most important to spend development effort. Now we couldn't guarantee that the the developers would then go to those areas and work because it's not a coercive relationship. I mean the developers are basically uh, scratching their own itches. Yes. So um, I wonder what percentage of Python users uh, involve an LDAP model versus a relational database model? Well, LDAP's usually used for things like authentication, mm -hmm. credential information, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, LDAP's widely used because, for example, I think that um, Microsoft's uh, Active Directory mm -hmm. is, is LDAP-based. Yes. Yes. So, uh, effectively, it's, it's a, a throwback or a retention from the old X500 standards, mm -hmm. but it, it's, a good, it's a good tool. And if so people are, if people are using LDAP for, for distributed authentication, okay. then obviously it's it's an essential library. Um, I'm not sure where it is, and but the the real question is, you know, how how do we get priority information about you know which tools a uh, porting effort will yield most benefit to the to the greatest number of users? And uh, if anyone can think of a way to to solve that problem generically for the foundation, I'd be forever grateful to them. That's why we have it. That's why yep. we have the foundation. Chris Candio again. Uh, does Python 3 make distributing applications easier? Uh, not specifically, no. You're probably aware, Chris, that um, the setup tools utilities have been re-implemented now as something called Distribute. Well, as far as I know, um, Distribute and setup tools are both available for both Python 2 and Python 3. I think that's right. So maybe setup tools isn't available for Python 3, but the plan is anyway that um, what's eventually going to happen is that setup tools 2 uh, will come out and be used both uh, by Python 3 users mm -hmm. and also it's, it's going to be backported as an external module for, for Python 2 users uh, as well. So um, I don't think there's anything specifically in Python 3 that makes distributing applications easier, no. But um, there is work going on on that area. OK, here's one that's interesting to me from Ben Johnston. Will O'Reilly School of Technology be offering a Django course soon? I've uh -huh. heard rumblings of this. Well, uh, I have been asking myself what I should write when I've finished the Python, th the, the, the Python certificate series. Mm -hmm. And uh, Django. So the, the Python certificate itself is, is more of a core yeah, basically Python the, the Python skills. certificate yeah, is, is intended to teach you the fundamentals of programming in Python, but the fundamentals of programming as well. So someone who's not a programmer ought really to be able to take the, the course if they, if they want to. Okay. Uh, but yeah, Django obviously is a specific application of Python. For mm -hmm. those of you who've not heard about it, it's a, uh, which apparently, by the way, included WordPress, who tried to call their latest release Django. 
Uh, but anyway, for those of you who've not heard about it, Django is a, a very popular web framework that is written in Python. Uh, so yeah, I think Django would, would make a terrific course. I'm not sure we could do it full justice in a, in a four class series. Yeah, it may end tough. up being a whole, a whole topic with, and with lots pylons of classes. And there's, you know, there's oh, well, and then I mean, you, yeah, you, you start to look at the other frameworks, yeah. pylons, pyramid, all, all of sure, these things. Sure. Yeah, then, then there's lots to do. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a Django course before too long. Okay. Um, we have one from Brian Petch, Peck. Uh, what is the status of database modules with respect to version 3? Um, not terribly satisfactory, I would say. Uh, when I was writing the database code and, and examples for uh, the second module in the Python certificate series, uh, I had a, a great deal of trouble finding um, a MySQL driver which would run under Python 3. Mm -hmm. It's getting better, but it, it definitely ne needs attention. Okay. Uh, Raul. Any GUI framework support for web app client application client development? None that I've heard of so far, but this is an area where sooner or later somebody has to do something because um, it's the only major piece of functionality that, that's stopping Python from being a, a full functionality web language as far as I can see. I mean, if we had uh, a visual web development tool of some kind, uh, then it would it would certainly make Python uh, web applications more popular. At the moment, the people who are developing web applications in Python uh, are the people who are you know they're smart enough not to need GUI based tools, if you mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if if GUI based tools were to become available, then it would certainly be a big help in uh, in improving Python's popularity. So I've not heard of anything, but I would definitely like it if such tools did arrive. It almost seems as if uh, we should send the video of this cast to the Python Software Foundation as a, a <laughs> list of suggestions, a wish well, list of I think it would be, I think it would be, <laughs> yeah, what, I think this, this would be very useful information to the, uh, the foundation, Excellent. particularly if we could capture you know, the questions we didn't have right. time for and the, uh, the chats yeah. as well. It would be good to analyze those later well, on. Well, there's too. always priorities that have to happen, the most important things, but it's great to have a wish list. It is, yes, it uh, is. Um, Matt Karenin uh, asks, is Python 3 moving to the latest, oh gosh, I know this term. Tile Tekinta. widget set. Yeah. Tile widget set. I knew it was something like that. I, <laughs> I don't believe it has. Certainly, I, I was using the old widgets when there's also GUI, tick into GUI code in, in uh, the second version of the second level of, uh, of the Python certificate module. And uh, no, it just seemed to be using the same old ones. As to what plans there are to move it to the new ones, again, I'm not really sufficiently closely in touch with the developers. I do know that um, Frederick Lunt did an enormous amount of work on Tikenta in the past, and I know that Frederick's kind of disappeared into the bowels of Google now. He works in, in Google's Zurich, and I haven't heard from him for a long time. So you know, I, I hear they Google don't are obviously sometimes for months. Well, yeah, Google are obviously keeping him, uh, keeping him busy, and he's a very talented programmer, so I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I don't know uh, whether Tikinta will actually start to, when Tikinta will start to use the latest tile widget set. Okay. Um, we have uh, Brian Jones again is asking, will there be a specific course reporting legacy code to Python 3 um, at the O'Reilly School? Well, we don't have one planned at the moment. Uh, ultimately, whether the school decided to go ahead with such a course would be you know, a marketing decision, I suppose, rather I, than anything else. Yeah, I, I want to say that porting one version to another would be more of a job of uh, an O'Reilly book perhaps, uh, right. considering yeah. that, that yeah. Our, our, our school tends to um, speak more to, um, you know, your, the core skills, the core skills that you need, and, and being able to um, use those core skills to be able to learn things like porting code and like, um, you know, specific things after that. You could pick up a book after you finish the courses and, and understand how to learn the new things because it's going on top of the, um, the foundation that you already have. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. It made sense to me, yeah. yes. I, I would say if, if O'Reilly happened to consider such a book, either Brian Jones or David Beasley, would, right. they'd both make excellent authors for such a book, yes. particularly since they'll have a lot of experience porting code for the, for the cookbook. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, there can be a chapter within 
uh, one of the courses which involves porting legacy code in general. Yep. You know, not necessarily from this particular to this particular. But that could be. I suppose one, one question I'd be interested to hear, since there is still just the chance to squeak a little bit of content into Python 4, is, is whether anybody would like, you know, whether it would be a good idea to include a, a lesson or two on differences between Python 2 and Python 3. Okay. Um, Ad and Pat, it looks more like a general Python question. What is the difference between a view being returned versus an iterator? Um, okay, a view is effectively a function that virtualizes the content of a, of a data object or data structure of some kind. Um, and so, for example, the I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, I believe iter keys may return a view. But effectively, when you're, when you're iterating over something like a dict, then you can't just use the standard um, iteration mechanism. And so uh, there has to be something there wh which, which produces, well, in, in Python 2, you'd just produce a list. Um, in Python 3, you've got a choice of either producing the iterator or the view. Uh, a view is used instead of an iterator when it's more convenient, basically, and there isn't a huge amount of difference between them. Okay. Effectively, a view just virtualizes the, uh, the content of the object so that it can be accessed in a, uh, an organized way. Okay. Uh, Michael Ritchie asks, did you find a MySQL module for 3.0, and <coughs> is there any support for MongoDB? Uh, I did, in fact, find a, a, a MySQL module for version 3.0, yes. Uh, I can't remember now which module it was, although a, a look at the lesson content would resolve that, but I did. Um, in terms of support for MongoDB, uh, I've just been working with, with Mongo on Python version 2. Did I say MongoDB? MongoDB? Well, MongoDB. MongoDB, Mongo Mongo yeah, right. Um, I've wow. been working with it in Python 2. <laughs> And I really don't think that there's anything that would stop the, the driver code from being ported uh, to Python 3. So um, I'm not aware of a port now, but I don't see anything standing in the way. Okay. Antonio Rodriguez asks, uh, is Python 4 uh -huh. already visible on the horizon? Did you mention this? Well, this is, this is actually um, a terminology problem that we continually have in O'Reilly, because the School of Technology refers to the uh, oh. the, the classes in the Python certificate yes. series is Python 1, 2, 3, and okay, 4. Okay, so it's a, this is a nomenclature problem. Yeah, so, so the Python 4... Python release 4 is not on the horizon. Python release 4 is not on the cards. Python course 4 within the four-course Python certificate series is on the horizon. I think yeah. April, May, something and, like yeah, that. Yeah, and that's, that's what I was talking about, so. whether, whether we needed it or whether it would be useful to include a lesson in the fourth uh, module of the certificate series. Right. about differences between Python 2 and right. Python 3. Yes, that is confusing. And so I no, I'm, I think that. if you said Python 4 to Guido, he'd probably run screaming from the room. I think he's, he's, uh, he's had to put up with a lot you know, <laughs> through the migration to Python 3. And I think, I think another major migration effort of that, of that nature is probably... Uh, Do you think he's listening somewhere? <laughs> not no. something he views with relish. <laughs> okay. All right. Are there any more questions? It seems that we are... Uh, we're about uh, 12 minutes out from 2 p.m. Yep, our time slot ends at 2, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. so, so we're, we're right on time. Um, so if there aren't any more, I would like to tell you that this webcast will be posted very soon, uh, both on O'Reilly and on O'ReillySchool.com on the websites there. So if there's anything you missed, then, uh, then you can watch it. And feel free to ask Steve, any more questions? Oh, we've, we've got a, a question now that could take up an hour all on its own, in oh, fact. Oh, gosh. Yeah, Adam Pat uh, has asked, are there any plans to make the GIL go away or be better in Python 3? The GIL no or GIL is the Global Interpreter Lock. Yeah. Now, this is something that the, the C Python implementation includes, basically to make certain operations faster by making sure that only one piece of, uh, oh. only one piece of the program is operating There's at a time, so it, going on. well, it maintains it maintains thread safety. Mm -hmm. But the the issue that that causes is that if you have a multi-threaded program, uh, you ideally you, you would want to get maximal efficiency by mm -hmm. running separate threads in parallel on separate CPUs. 
Unfortunately, because of the presence of the global interpreter lock in Python, mm -hmm. that means that the, uh, generally speaking, I mean, there are certain cases where it's not true, but in general, only one thread of your Python code can be running at a time okay. because the global interpreter lock means that, that uh, anything that was trying to run on another CPU would simply be stalled waiting for the lock to be released by the running code on the first ah, CPU. Okay. Now, um, Putting it all into one mm. line. Well, yeah, it, it's a constraint which, which we'd certainly mm. rather be rid of, but there are different opinions about how the constraint should be removed. So first of all, let me point out that as far as I'm aware, there is no global interpreter lock in Iron Python. So if you if you really want to go crazy with parallelism right now, Iron Python's available. Um, the guys in the PyPy crew, PYPY, are also looking, I think they do have some kind of lock, but they're looking at, at removing it because it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as, as tightly integrated as it is in, in Python, in C Python 3. But the, the C Python implementation, uh, basically, uh, Guido has said it's never going to lose the global interpreter lock. Guido's approach is that you should make use of multiple CPUs by writing multiple processes which communicate with each other using whatever operating system functionality you choose. And I think that that, that was probably one of the reasons why the multiprocessing module uh, was included in Python because uh, that actually does allow it allow us a very easy way to to create new processes. So uh, in short, Paul, no, sorry, the GIL is not going away. Uh, sorry, it wasn't Paul, was it? Yes, it was Paul. The GIL is not going away. Um, well, Paul does ask <coughs> a follow-up question. Is it reasonable to say that because of the GIL thread should be avoided in Python? That's a good question. Um, no, I've I've used threads in Python. Uh, I used threads, for example, to write a, a, a mail sending program that, that was sending about two or three hundred pieces of mail in parallel from a single process. There are better ways uh, to handle concurrency, but uh, I wouldn't say don't use threading. I would say don't expect threading to give you uh, the speed up that you might expect by, by using multiple cores, because because of the global interpreter lock, it's not going to do okay. that. But it sounds as though Paul's fairly well aware of that. Okay, Brian Jones asks, uh, are there new functional paradigm supports in, is there a new functional paradigm support in 3.x? Anything cool? I've seen some Erlang head Erlang tail, -like head -tail -like stuff. Erlang head stuff. Um, anything else? Well, I'm probably not the best person to ask about functional paradigm support, Brian, because I'm not uh, really a functional programmer, so I'm, I'm not aware of anything else, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything else in there. And uh, Michael Ritchie asks, Steve, have you ever been confused with John Cleese? Um, <laughs> he's a little taller than I am, I think, and not quite so good looking. So, <laughs> <coughs> No, I have, I have never been confused with John Cleese visually, <laughs> although I, I do like to feel I do a good John Cleese impression. Unfortunately, I'm most likely wrong, so I'm not going to give the, uh, the viewers the benefit of We do of have such. eight minutes left to try. Oh, uh, well, okay, maybe, maybe <laughs> just before the end then. Uh, and Martin Hines asks, are there any special offers for the Python course? That That's one for you, I think, Trish. Uh, yeah, um, you know what? Check back next week. There may just be something. Uh, check back at O'ReillySchool.com. So I, I can't promise anything, but uh, okay. yeah, stay tuned. Um, and if you'd like to follow Steve on Twitter um, for any other questions, it's uh, Holden Webb. H -O -L at Web, yeah. Yes, at Holden Web, H O L D E N W E B. And there's also an O'Reilly School, uh, one word, yep. Twitter handle. Um, definitely ask your questions on one of those uh, uh, Twitter accounts. Or if you would like to come to Facebook, facebook.com slash O'Reilly School, um, to ask questions there in a longer format. Um, or if you would like to see this webcast again, it's going to be posted on O'ReillySchool.com and on O'Reilly.com, and eventually it will be also on the O'Reilly School channel on YouTube. Somebody okay. apparently thinks you look like Reese Witherspoon. I do get that a lot, yes. <laughs> I, think she's, I think she's much better looking than Reese Witherspoon, but there oh, you go. Oh, stop it. <laughs> okay, can you repeat okay. Steve's didn't catch it? Yes, it's at Holden Webb, H-O-L-D-E-N-W-E-B. Okay. And that will get me on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, basically, even uh, when I go to PyCon, 
I meet friends that I haven't seen for a couple of years, and they say, "Hi, Holden Webb." So it's it's become my name, my real name. You know, it's almost people call more people call me Holden Webb than Steve. And be sure to catch Steve at OzCon and PyCon. Oh, indeed, yes, PyCon coming up um, very soon. It's it's actually uh, what is it? A week on a week next. Friday, I think it starts. So it's about uh, two two weeks away. Yes, two okay. weeks away today. Uh, we've got OSCON in summer, where we're trying to make sure that there's a, a stronger Python presence this year. We've got four people uh, who've been reviewing the uh, four extra people who've been reviewing the Python submissions, and it looks like we've got some good stuff in there. Okay, great. Um, and and Brian Jones asks if there are any other Python uh, books upcoming. From O'Reilly, I wish I could speak to that. I, I am unaware. I'm, I apologize, but perhaps uh, Marcy and the other folks at O'Reilly would be able to help you with that. I'm sure there's plenty coming out. Um, so again, I want to thank you. Uh, I'm Trish Gray from the O'Reilly School of Technology, and thank you, Steve, so much. Thank you. And fantastic. It's so great uh, to to tap into your expertise. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks for coming, and I'll see you next time. It's been good uh, spending time with you guys. Thanks for all the questions, and uh, I hope that we'll see each other at PyCon. <laughs>